So, Michael, welcome to Unconventional. Hey, Ella. Thanks for having me. You committed $300 million to help rejuvenation biotech startups. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. We did made the decision beginning of the year. Yeah. Basically, it's going to be a big revolution uh, in, in, the, in the field of medicine. It's, it's a bit invisible, invisible um, but ba basically it's, um, the world has started the transition from one where we were completely helpless about age-related diseases to one where we have aging under full medical control and can um, eradicate uh, age-related diseases such as heart attack, stroke, cancer, and, 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 and so on. And uh, in order to advance this field, I've committed another 300 million now um, to advance our key startups. We have several startups that work on root causes. One, for example, is working on uh, heart attacks and strokes. So if we succeed, we'll probably get rid of heart attacks and strokes, which, which are one of the major killers in the world. And in order to forward them through all clinical phases, um, we need more than a few million dollars. So I, uh, we made a decision to support our key startups to invest this 300 million uh, euros or 360 million dollars um, over the next five years in order to bring um, actual therapies to people. Mm -hmm. So I would like to step back for a moment because for many people, age-related diseases are the norm. When you age, you get sick. So what you're offering is a very different, unconventional um, perspective of the world. Is it really possible to get uh, older and remain healthy without any health issues coming up? Yes, uh, if you mean, make, main, main, uh, if you mean uh, older in terms of adding years from the calendar, yes. Um, but there is no such thing as healthy aging. So if, if the body physically ages, uh, you will have age-related diseases. And uh, the reality is that if we would be old enough or would become old enough, everybody would get all the age-related diseases that are out there. Then in reality, of course, um, uh, one person uh, dies of cancer, the next one dies of a heart attack, the next one dies of a stroke or a neurodegenerative disease. Um, yeah, but that, that's, that's basically it. So, and this, the science that we are working on is called rejuvenation biotechnology. And uh, very, very, very smart scientists have asked them, why do we have these age-related diseases? And they really go, uh, went back to the chain and they, they came to the, to the amazing fact that there are certain root causes um, that can be um, uh, treated in isolation uh, uh, that, that are the root cause where the age-related disease or aging originates. And of course, it's a complex field. Um, you, the, the, depending on how you see it, you can classify this as like at six, eight or ten categories of root causes. They have sub-causes as well. Um, but basically, these are all physical processes that are going, uh, going on and that can be treated individually. And uh, to give you an example of what we're doing, one of the um, heart attacks and strokes, they happen because you know, there, uh, there's plaque building up in the arteries um, uh, as we age. For some people faster, for some people slower, but it's happening for everybody. And this plaque at some point um, uh, in, in the artery wall, uh, uh, is the, the, the plaque is too much, the artery wall ruptures. Uh, spills the, the plug into the artery, then um, uh, blood clot forms with, the, with, the, with, uh, with all that stuff. And then the artery is blocked and then you have a heart attack. So uh, basically what we are working on is a specific therapy on rejuvenation, uh, rejuvenating the, the um, cardiovascular system in a way that we can remove the plug from the artery walls and uh, no plug, no heart attacks or no strokes, basically. So... Um you said uh, there's no healthy aging. So are we talking about not aging at all with these treatments? Yes, but that, that's basically the goal, that we would not age in a physical way. Yeah. And is this possible? Are there any examples in any form on, on this planet, where, whether it's with bacteria or you know, single-cell organisms or anything like that? Oh, yes, absolutely. There are, there are several examples, uh, like... Um, uh, special sorts of lob lobsters, but also um, 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 some uh, aquatic life forms, which are basically immortal. So they, uh, of course, they're simple life forms, but they have uh, what, what science calls natural senescence. So basically, um, their body does not age. So it, it's nothing unknown. Yeah. 
but they still die, right? Without being killed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course you can still die. I mean, you can still die as a young person. You can die of, of all reasons like viruses, diseases, uh, accidents, trauma, uh, violence and whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But the end goal would be that our body, uh, at least um, we slow down aging by these therapy, therapies uh, a, a lot. Of course, uh, this is not immortality. It's just slowing down aging, repairing stuff. Um, we don't know whether we can repair everything. So this is simply not proven. Um, uh, we, we just, the, 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 this small industry that, that is... Um, uh, starting, it's just taking it step by step. For example, getting plug out of the artery to avoid heart attacks, and then there's the next thing: there's cancer and so, and so forth. So you have to really tackle one thing by the other. And um, we we actually don't know whether we can um, uh, uh, get rid of all age-related diseases. That's that's still uh, unproven, uh, uh, unknown. And uh, of course, we don't know what the life expectancy will be then. But uh, it will definitely be longer. Basically, we want to uh, help uh, to develop te technologies that get rid of the age-related diseases. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that we can prevent death, so you're going to die. Um, uh, it's not immortality, you can't say this often enough. It's uh, simply getting all um, uh, rid of, hopefully, uh, uh, all age-related diseases. Uh, that would be the end goal. And um, even if we're not getting rid of all age-related diseases, um, it's a huge different, uh, difference is on, on even on, on an individual level, whether you die at a, of a heart attack at the age of 65 or you live up to uh, 85 or 90. Makes a huge difference, of course. And how many years are we talking about adding to our lifetime right now? Is it 20? Is it 200? We, Do you we have don't any know numbers? yet. We, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. What we know is if, for example, this treatment succeeds, um, we are probably going to eradicate like 80% of, of heart attacks and strokes. 20% um, of, uh, of the, those uh, things have other reasons, but um, uh, that, that's what we're talking about. And that we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that die of that every year. And uh, these deaths can be avoided for that reason. Maybe people die or probably people are going to die of other things. And even if you would keep the body in perfect shape, we still don't know what this makes uh, with our brain. So um, yeah. uh, uh, we don't know what 200 years of ha heartbreaks and losses and ups and downs would do to our psyche. We simply don't know. But I'd rather find out than die at the age of 75 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, as a teenager, I was a big fan of vampire stories. And I read the Anne Rice's entire uh, vampire uh, trilogy and um, or the series actually and uh, there were beings there who lived since the Roman times so uh, thousand two thousand years old uh, beings and they were actually dying to die because they were so tired of losing everyone they loved and getting their hearts broken so many times and also the adaptation to changing times non-stop like imagine just what happened during our lifetimes here with the technology internet mobile phones and just take that uh, kind of trend and apply it into the future and then ex imagine being exposed to that for thousands of years I mean that must be in some ways exhausting so do you think this is for everyone. How do you see some individuals I, I, I reacting think, to this? I, I think it's not not uh, it's not quite comparable because these therapies will be available to everybody, also so to your loved ones, so you can take them with them on the journey. And I mean, if you go back in, in history, like um, in the 15th century or so, people were uh, the average life expectancy was 35. Um, wow. And um, uh, people were dying of, of infectious diseases and, and all uh, uh, really gruesome stuff. And um, now our av average life expectancy is uh, almost 80 years old. And um, uh, we're not, let, let's not talk about thousands of years, but wouldn't it be great like to live to 120, 150 in perfect health just to double our lifespan and, and then see what it comes. And the other thing is, um, yes, we're living in these exponential times and um, uh, we have to deal with that anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, with the nation or not, uh, times are changing so fast and the, 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 the speed of change is even increasing. Uh, so we have to deal with this anyhow. Yeah, that's true. Then the next question that comes to my mind is what 
would be the societal impact of everyone living together longer? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And um, I think you have to give this question even a wider context because um, uh, longevity or healthy longevity is not going to happen on its own. So uh, I think it would be a big mistake just to imagine our current society, our current technology, and, and then living longer. But you have to see it in a bigger context of artificial intelligence that's in emerging, robotics, nanotechnology, all these new technologies that are exponentially um, so uh, I think we are going, even without rejuvenation, we are, we, are, we are developing towards a world where, in, at least in the civilized world, um, you probably only have to work for a few hours per day or even per week um, to make a living. And um, uh, we, we definitely have to rethink what does it mean to be human if you don't have to fight for survival every day. Uh, it's going to have a huge impact, uh, amplified, of course, by healthy longevity and being here for longer and I see a huge impact not only on, on society but also on relationships, career paths but also personally I think um, we have to do a lot of self-development, um, we have to um, do some spiritual development as well because the, the, um, the fundamentals of our existence are going to change radically and we have to cope with that. Do you kind of foresee a mental health crisis because if you are to work three four hours a week and uh, and that pressure is removed to survive but then we live 120 130 years as healthy beings how do we find purpose in such a setting what would keep us alive that's a very good question for to answer your question no i don't see a crisis i see a uh, 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 Maybe a challenge, yeah, it's a challenge, but I see a, a huge opportunity. And it's, it, this is going to be a very individual decision that everyone has to make who lives through that. So there, I think there's no generalizable answer to that. But yes, this challenge, everybody will face this challenge in the foreseeable future. And um, there will, will be people who do not want to deal with this. Um, uh, I mean, you can see it even today that there are people who have a really hard time dealing with change at all. And, um, and also the opportunities might not be for everybody, but that really remains to be seen. It's, I think it's a very individual decision. For me, the future is uh, full of opportunities. I'm super positive about that. Uh, I mean, imagine we will go to space, we were going to settle the solar system. Uh, we're going to have artificial intelligence, we're going to have humanoid robots, we're going to have self-driving cars. And the, 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 the thing even goes further because it also will touch architecture, art. Everything will be, uh, will be changed by that. I mean, how are, are we going to live? How, if, if we do not uh, screw up the planet, we're going to have maybe an ecological utopia with beautiful architecture. So all this possible. But isn't there also a kind of dark potential there uh, as always with all the technology <laughs> it depends on what, what you make of it but um, uh, in in the end i think it, it's going to be um, an individual decision and then i think there also will be individuals that that make a positive decision about the future that are going to form communities where they can live their positive um, dream yeah yeah i'm always afraid of us using any technology for the worse and uh, one scenario that came to my mind around longevity, like what would happen if it was used in prisons uh, with people who are prisoned for life and then you kind of elongate their prison sentence by elongating their life? That, that, that uh, in, in reality, a, a lifetime sentence, for example, in Germany is just 30 years. So it's not, not lifetime. So, yes. But if you kill somebody, maybe we have to rethink this. But we have to rethink so many things. Um, yeah. The world, the, the, the fact is, the world is going to change whether we like it or not. So the only decision is whether we drive this change and we, we um, use the change and, and we uh, steer the change in a certain direction by contributing to it in a positive way. Or it's always stand by, we are bystanders and it's going to happen and we have to accept whatever comes out. Yeah. I prefer the first option to, to drive the change in, in, in a positive way. Exactly. But as we talk, I realized how many different areas are touched by this uh, technology that you're so heavily investing in. Because, for example, what will happen 
uh, with the environment. We will live longer and we will consume more. And what would be the um, kind of consequences of this and how can we tackle this, for example? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, but it is, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, we have to be honest to ourselves and we have to answer these questions anyhow, rejuvenation or not. I mean, uh, what we do right now to the planet is not sustainable. It's, it's the, we need sustainable agriculture, we need uh, sustainable energy, we need sustainable transportation. Um, th this has to be done anyhow. So independent of extending the healthy lifespan, we have to deal with our planet in a completely different way or it will not uh, have a happy end. So um, uh, yes, I think we, j we have to take care of that anyhow. Mm -hmm. And with Forever Healthy, to what degree do you feel responsible for these consequences or are you strictly focused on uh, the science part of this? The consequences are already there. So um, you can turn the question on its head. So which, which, uh, which uh, uh, disease should we not cure? So that's, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's exactly reversing the question. So, do you, so, so shouldn't we cure cancer or shouldn't we cure heart disease or stroke or neurodegenerative disease? And uh, I would say, uh, of course, we want to cure all the diseases and uh, let's do our homework and, uh, and uh, uh, do the right thing to the planet by, doing, by, by being sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and can you please tell us about um, the works you did for our health? Because I know you evaluate a lot of uh, scientific papers and create a snapshot of world scientific knowledge. What is the process exactly with, with the works you do there? Okay, yeah, we have, we have two fields in Forever Healthy. One is the future-oriented stuff, where we, uh, where we actually we fund research on um, uh, basic technologies for, that could serve for therapies. We run a conference and we do invest in these startups. So this is all future-oriented. Um, but we also, other part of Forever Healthy is uh, dealing with the present. What can we do today in order to extend a healthy lifespan? And as longer as we stay healthy now, the better are the chances that we can use these beautiful technologies that will come up in the future. And in, the in this part, uh, what we can do now, we have several initiatives. Um, the main one is called Rejuvenation Now, where we look uh, at all the therapies, and there are uh, quite some therapies, of course, they're crude, they're the first generation, um, that you could already do today to extend your healthy lifespan and to lower the probability to fall prey of an age-related disease. And um, so we have a long backlog. We uh, look at one uh, topic after the other, and uh, then we go in and look at all the research that's available. And we do what we call risk and benefit analysis. Um, usually, we, if we look at the topic, it's like uh, between two and 3,000 scientific papers. Um, usually, you're, you're dealing with like 150 study, uh, studies in humans around that. And then we do a dedicated write-up. So um, how would this therapy look like? What's the optimal treatment protocol? What are the risks? What are the benefits? What could be a, a potential risk mitigation strategy? And then we publish that open access on our website, so freely available for everybody. Exactly. And that's also fascinating. And I think it's available in a language that you don't have to be a scientist to understand what you publish. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah you, I mean, yeah, you have to be a bit dedicated because it's not like uh, um, uh, it's not like popular science um, because the, the knowledge base serves two audiences. One is really interested people who want to use the therapies. And on the other hand, it's like for interested uh, doctors who, who might want to wonder whether they could offer such therapy to their clients in order to help them stay healthy longer. Mm -hmm. So do, is there, I mean, I can imagine so many um, advantages to this openness, but is there any risk? Have you ever thought about any cons to sharing such um, summarized information in such an available way? Well, no, no, not at all. I mean, I, I really believe in, in, in uh, information should be free and open. Uh, uh, and that drives um, uh, innovation. And when we even invite people, we have a special portal where you can comment on all our work. And we're really happy. We have like um, almost 100 top scientists uh, on, that, on that portal. Um, so they can comment on the papers that we publish because we want, uh, uh, we want to have the best possible snapshot of what's available there. So I don't see a downside. 
Mm -hmm. And how do you choose these topics? Because we are not short of illnesses caused by aging. So where do you start? Oh, well, actually, of course, we are deep into the, to, 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 to the field. And um, uh, I mean, we are on conferences and um, uh, uh, the, the information is really distributed about books, blogs, specialists. And we are in very good contact with lots of people. And uh, basically, we, we have a long list of potential therapies uh, that are possible because it's not possible to do everything right now. There are lots of things that we cannot do, but there are some things that we can do already. And, uh, uh, and then in the team, we decide, okay, which is the next topic that we want to tackle. And uh, basically, it's out of personal interest. It's the stuff that I also I want to do for myself. Uh, I really want to know about, can I do this therapy or not? And uh, can you give us some examples of the topics you have examined so far? Oh yeah, we've 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 published like uh, nine papers so far in that area. One, for example, is a um, a way to decalcify um, um, uh, the cardiovascular system. So what happens over time is that uh, bone material is deposited in in uh, in places where it shouldn't be where it doesn't belong. And that leads to a calcification, for example, of capillaries and, and arteries and a stiffening of those. And um, uh, uh, it was discovered like in the 1930s or even from earlier that um, people working in, 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 in battery factories, they had a, a huge issue with lead poisoning. And uh, to depoison or to detoxify that, there is a special protein that's called EDTA. And um, so people were giving EDTA to get rid of the lead in, in their um, uh, blood and in their body. And it was later discovered that people using that treatment also had uh, a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was discovered that the EDTA actually decals, you can decalcify the, um, uh, the body. And we did a quite extensive um, a review on that topic and also propose a protocol because you can do uh, infusions of EDTA um, over a year's time and actually to get the calcification out of your arteries. Okay, okay. If I remember correctly, you also published a paper on um, COVID-19, is that correct? Yeah, that's true. That's, uh, that was a side project because of when, when COVID came up, uh, we, we, we stopped our, our work on rejuvenation and we w were wondering whether there's anything that's available that you could do to strengthen the immune system uh, and also to um, uh, lessen the impact if you have uh, COVID to lessen that. And what we did is we um, looked at the, the, there were numerous websites and doctors and all proposing different things. So we took the 50 most proposed supplements or um, approaches um, to lessen the, the severity of the, the, the disease or uh, strengthen the immune system so that you might even have an asymptomatic um, uh, uh, disease, a uh, uh, COVID case. And uh, basically we reviewed all these 50 and we came up with a list of eight things that are uh, most probably are going to work in order to um, strengthen the immune system um, or even lessen the severity of the disease. Um, uh, a lot of stuff that has uh, worked in, in other coronaviruses, because this is not the first coronavirus that we see. Can you recall a few of these things? Uh, yeah, it's vitamin D. There, there was a high dose vitamin D, uh, quercetin, uh, which is a supplement you can get everywhere. There is um, uh, uh, elderberry uh, is, is working. Um, uh, you could have that either, either as a syrup or as, as, as tablets. Echinacea. Uh, uh, also working, yeah, uh, to name a few. Uh, and, and the full list is, is on the Forever Healthy website. And I haven't seen these supplements recommended by officially by any anywhere, actually. Is that right? Uh, well, officially, it's, it's like there's the Institute for Functional Medicine that has some recommendations mm -hmm. and uh, others. But the, the, our current medical system is very much geared to, towards uh, pharmaceuticals and vaccination. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also all has uh, its place. But uh, of course, if you can strengthen the immune system or lessen the severity of a disease by using just some natural supplements, that's also quite helpful. So mm -hmm. it's a complementary thing, I think. Yeah. 
And that brings me to my next question. How do you filter all the all these scientific papers? Because some are funded by pharmaceutical companies or some are funded by, uh, privately. So do you filter as you kind of evaluate these papers? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Each paper um, that we... So we first, the, the process is we... we we screen everything that's there, there's that is, that is like 3,000 papers, then we pick the studies that are really relevant, not considering their, their quality, and uh, then that gets us down to depending between 150, sometimes 200, 300 studies, and then actually we read all the studies in detail and, and really evaluate each, each individual study, and each study also gets a, an uncertainty score, a quality score and an uncertainty score depending on whether, for example, it's a, a double-blind uh, a, a study or it's a single or it's open-label. Open-label, for example, is when people know what they're getting. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people are getting under control, some people are not. If, if you don't know whether you're the control group or not, then it's a double-blind study. Uh, if uh, only the doctors know whether you get the, who gets what, then a single-blind study. Or you can have open label studies where people actually know I'm getting the the treatment or I'm getting a placebo, and um, and the lowest uh, uh, case of evidence is so-called case reports where doctors just report uh, what they did and that they had a result. So it's not a, a real study, but it's it's called a case report. And I just mentioned EDTA, uh, and EDTA was used for a long time by doctors, and there are more than 30,000 case reports on, on EDTA where doctors said, I used that thing, and it worked. And um, so, yeah, but you differentiate between these things, and uh, we have a scoring system that goes for risks, and both risks and benefits, and uh, for each risk and benefit, also the quality of the study is taken into account, and the, um, also the magnitude of the effect that it has. Mm -hmm. Isn't this done by other institutions anyway? It sounds very kind of common sense. Well, um, it is done. What uh, there there is such a thing as called uh, systematic reviews, um, where you do a meta analysis of other studies. Um, but it's not in the, done in the way that we do it because our goal is uh, in the end is actionable information. So uh, the last section is always okay. Uh, um, uh, for question is would we do the therapy or not and um, so this goes far beyond a, a systematic review of a topic and also uh, it's much more in detail in terms of weighting risks and benefits um, because we always come from this um, do we want to do the treatment or not under which is, is that reasonable to do it what is possible risk management and particularly for um, rejuvenation therapies of uh, therapies extending the healthy lifespan and um, nobody's doing this in that depth because it's, it's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And once you have these actionable results, uh, do you then move forward to actually uh, tests, see if they work, or do you go further into treatments? Well, I do that stuff, so that's a very personal thing. We, mm -hmm. um, we um, basically, we are doing things that are already done, you know, this is like EDTA has been done for more than 50 years, and I'm doing that myself. Um, there are other things that that, that we looked into um, that also come out negative, for example, a treatment with a, uh, a compound called dazatinib and quercetin to remove senescent cells. Uh, we found that it's not worth doing it and that the risks are too high uh, and outweigh the benefits, so we're, I, I'm not doing it. And mm -hmm. Um, but we're not offering services and that or running clinical trials or so. We publish the results and then it's a very individual decision whether you do this together with your doctor or not. Okay, and do you have plans to move forward with clinical studies in the future or build a center mm -hmm. to kind of work with individuals? Well, right now we are in the information gathering phase and, and, and working on our own health. We are not at the point where like we're not going to do clinical trials um, this is not our thing. We just want to analyze what's out there that we, what we can use um, because I want this, I mean, and I and other people want this for themselves. So the question is really, what can I do today? And um, of course, it would be helpful if you have an environment that supports you, like doctors doing that. Yep. Um, uh, there are some doctors starting up in, in what they call longevity medicine, but that's really super early days. And um, uh, so far, we have no concrete plans and opening 
uh, or creating a center like this. This might be something in the future, but we actually don't know yet. Do you know how this information is used by any institutions or doctors in any way? Do you get feedback for that? Uh, only, only little feedback, I have to say. It's really the super early days. Um, uh, we have some doctors that we work with that say, hey, this is great information, but it's not so that thousands of doctors are already doing this. So it's really, really the early days for the whole thing, you know. And are you like actively marketing it right now or are you just doing the research, releasing it and letting it kind of spread by word of mouth? Uh, well, yeah, there's word of mouth, but we, we are... Um, we, um, we have a mailing list where people can register, so um, uh, we inform them if there's anything new. And what we also do is whenever we have a new paper, we do an online meetup. We do an online um, uh, presentation, one hour, like a mini conference where we, um, where we uh, uh, talk about the results of the paper that we did. So that the whole thing is then top, uh, top, uh, topically around EDTA. And what we also get an, an external specialist and um, since our topics are so in depth, we, we so far managed to get always the, the world leading specialist on that topic, um, on EDTA, for example, or on light therapy, also to give a, a small talk. And then we have a Q&A session and we promote these meetups also in the longevity community um, mm -hmm. to generate awareness about what we're doing. And they're open, so everybody can, um, can be... Um, can attend the meetup so it's not uh, exclusive to scientists or, or doctors mm -hmm. so as an individual if i'm interested in improving my health and boosting my uh, lifespan i can kind of sign up to these events and like look at your paper and maybe take bring up some issues with my doctor and saying this is a concern for me or what do you think about this and hopefully i will have a doctor who will respond to that and say okay we can take this information and use it this way to, for you to benefit from it, right? Absolutely. That's the idea. That's really uh, one of the two major target groups is uh, people who are really so interested in their health. They take that to their doctor and says, hey, let's talk about this. I would love to do this. And uh, maybe he finds a doctor that's open to that and that, that will help him. And I think this is for us or for me, this is how I can help people everywhere on the planet because <laughs> our, our research is published in English, of course. And everybody can freely take it to his doctor and uh, have that conversation. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, come up with this idea? This is, in, in some ways, as you explain, it's so intuitive and it's common sense. And in some ways, it's so new because it's not done and we don't see health like this. So what was your journey that led you to Forever Healthy? Yeah, yeah basic my journey started uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, after I built my um, big internet companies and uh, I was the epitome of a hacker, you know, I was really like, <laughs> I was overweight, no sport, uh, <laughs> chips, pizza, red wine, uh, smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. So that was really It's so cool. hard to imagine you yeah, like that, absolutely. Michael, knowing you, you know, as a person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I was really like, you could have me in the movie and everybody would say, oh, no, that's not true. That's totally... Uh, that's totally exaggerated, but I was really that person. And at some point I thought, oh no, it can't go on that way. You've been so successful. It would be stupid like if you, uh, if you kick the can right now. I mean, if you have a heart yeah. attack or all that stuff. So but really, what was the turning point? Like what made you think of that? Well, it, it was like, uh, it, it was a process. I thought, oh no, it can't go on like this. I know you have this sometimes in life. I think, oh, I can't go on like this. And uh, so I stopped smoking, I, uh, I looked into changing my diet and, and then I discovered, I, I thought, oh, that's easy because you just go to, on the internet and, 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 and look up how a good diet is. And then I discovered, oh, diet is more like religion than science. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and and uh, then I started reading myself because I couldn't find any useful information like on, 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 on the surface. And I got into functional medicine, I got into mm -hmm. uh, nutrition. And um, at some point, it, I, I thought this is really overwhelming to do it all on my own. And I thought, it, wouldn't it be great to have a team um, uh, that would just do this research and, and this analysis about what is out there and how credible is this or that information? Yeah, and this was when I started. Uh, I, I built my first website for Forever Healthy because I learned all this stuff myself. And I wanted to share it with my loved ones. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, why have the same talk over and over again? So I built a website, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, obviously. 
and, and put that on, 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 on the web, called it Forever Healthy. Um, so people who are interested, could, could, I could share, share my learnings because, you know, I'm a techie and, and in, in technology we have this open source uh, paradigm for software. So software is uh, developed by a team and then given away for free. That's, that's how the whole internet is built. And then people build business models on top of that. And uh, yeah, and I was at a point also personally where, I was, where, where we were so successful with the, building the companies and after that going to venture capital and uh, we made, made quite successful investments. Three of the startups that we supported right from the start where we were the founding investors, they now turned unicorns like Bubble, Stuffface and Mambo. And mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was not the question, do I want to do another startup and make even more money? But mm -hmm. for me, it was the question, okay, how can I contribute so, and, and work on something? I've been always working on the leading edge of technology. And, and for me, this is rejuvenation is my leading edge right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, listening to you, it sounds like it, it wasn't like you had a little, I mean, you had a heart attack and that was a wake up call. It sounds like maybe success was a wake up call. Now yeah. that you're successful, you have a lot to contribute and to, to kind of uh, take care of. Uh, and how can you make sure that you're healthy enough and how can you make sure that you live long enough to contribute? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And it was, it was also a pro process in parallel with my health is we, we sold our businesses. We sold lastminute.de uh, uh, and then we sold web.de um, because it was no fun anymore. I mean, the, 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 the company had grown from three people to, uh, in the end, we had 700 people uh, mm -hmm. working for us. And uh, I did all the stuff that I never wanted to do. <laughs> and yeah. I didn't do the stuff that I wanted to do is working in technology, but we had like HR meetings and planning meetings and finance meetings and all that stuff. And I was really like, uh, I don't want this anymore in my life. And um, so we sold that. And uh, uh, of course, then you're at the turning point. You say, oh, what, what now? You know, and then I made the decision. I don't want to run a company, big company anymore, um, because I had this uh, several times and uh, I don't need this <laughs> one more time. Yeah. And where does this uh, entrepreneurial spirit come from? Was it in your family? How did you build this up? Yes, I mean, my, my, my family was really supportive to us. So um, uh, my dad was uh, employee number three at uh, Hewlett Packard in, in Germany. So, uh, one of the, the major technology tech companies by them, or if not the major technology company. And he always encouraged us uh, to, uh, he helped us. He gave us our first computer when we couldn't afford it. I mean, uh, 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 our parents were moderately wealthy, but uh, he gave us an Apple II computer. We couldn't have bought it on our own, so it was mm -hmm. eleven thousand D marks or so out, totally out of <laughs> as a like a skinny old to buy something like this. But and and this is how we got into the whole thing. And our parents always encouraged us to to follow our dreams, and um, uh, uh, and this is how for us it was all was always play. Somehow we like computers and we like programming and we like hacking and developing games and software. And it was never really uh, a work for money. So I was really happy in that, that it was always like our technology is so cool. And I want to, and it's still the same thing. I want to develop technology. I mean, the technology is always being on the forefront of where humanity is. And uh, I mean, we, I, I've been through all this, like, the transition from no computers to computers or PCs. I mean, uh, uh, there was a world where there wasn't, where, where in PCs or where in computers. So we made yep. the transition. We made the transition from no mobile phones to mobile phones to uh, from no internet to internet, from no cloud services to cloud services. And uh, right now we're in the transition from no rejuvenation to rejuvenation. You know? so for me, it's a logical extension, but in a different role not as an uh, uh, a CEO of a big company anymore. I don't want to. Yeah. And how is this uh, change from no rejuvenation to rejuvenation will shape the ordinary healthcare systems most people use? I, I, uh, so in, in, in the end, I think it will completely change the paradigm in medicine because right now our paradigm in medicine is about making sick people healthy again. So you go to your doctor, or you go to the hospital when you're sick, and then they try to fix you up somehow. And I think the new paradigm, and that's also that we are working on, on the really highest level 
our thoughts is um, medicine should really be turned up on its head. Of course, for trauma, if you break your leg, if you have something severe, a virus, of course, that has to be taken care of. But for keeping people healthy, it should be really um, shift to a, there should be a paradigm shift to keeping healthy people healthy. So th this is a completely different approach. It's, it's preventive medicine, but much more than that even. So it's like a maintenance of healthy people, so to say. It's so where you go regularly to your health and longevity doctor, who is more a trusted friend and advisor, who helps you to stay healthy, who advises you on nutrition, who does, does regular monitoring of your health, with regular blood draws, stool, urine testing, and to detect um, if something is off early, to counteract that. So it's a completely different approach. Yeah, and not just healthcare-wise, but also, for example, insurance companies mostly don't support such checkups, not so often, at least, yes. right? Yeah, but I think this has to change because the um, it's it, simply it's more economical uh, to keep people healthy instead of like to fix broken people. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. a heart attack is extremely expensive, but giving somebody a pill, uh, let, let's say, for example, the product that we are working on. Uh, um, uh, that gets the plug out of the arteries. Um, personally, I envision that we have a product that costs ten dollars a month in the civilized, uh, like like say in the Western world, and for uh, developing countries even um, less expensive. So um, that would be ten dollars a month, and that would make sure that you don't have a heart attack or stroke. And heart attack and stroke, a big killer, but also disability after stroke uh, is e extremely expensive compared to $10 a month uh, for preventing it. So uh, it's much more economically feasible preventing um, a disease than curing disease. And actually, it sounds more accessible for the individual too. I'd rather spend $10 a month uh, preventing something that I'm likely to get than end up with a big hospital bill. Yes, absolutely. My vision is it will really come out that way because we all age the same way um, so we're talking about everybody, let's say, over the age of 40 or so on the planet. That's like 4 billion people. And, and um, so we, this is a huge market and you have a lot of competing companies. And as always in technology, it's like a huge market with competing co uh, companies means that the quality will go up and the price will uh, go down. Mm -hmm. so, uh, no question in that. So, yeah, exactly. That was what I was thinking, actually. Like, how many of these $10 pills do I need to take in order to prevent several risks? We don't know. We don't know yet. Uh, but it's also, it's quite imaginable that you have a combination pill that you take. Yeah. One pill that combines everything and then something, some things might be by injection. So you get an injection once a month or once every six months. Of course, we don't know yet how this will play out. But um, it's going to be manageable. I'm quite mm -hmm. sure of that. And there are insurance policies, I think, towards the higher end policies that include such checkups and maybe um, interventions. But this is not available to the majority of public right now. Is that That's right? True, yeah. But this is uh, the same with every new technology. In the beginning, it's unproven and it's super expensive. Uh, like, I mean, remember the first mobile phones that when well, right now we have the fifth generation network, uh, we started with the B network in Germany, then there was the C network, the D network, then 3G, now 4G, 5G. And the B network, you had like boxes, like a suit <laughs> you had to, to, to carry around. Uh, That's really true. expensive. You could only make a phone call and you have even to dial into the, the tower. You have to know which is the next tower. You have, to, <laughs> you have to subscribe to that tower and then you can make a phone call, you know. And... Um, and uh, over time, now everybody in Africa has a mobile phone because it's cheaper than a landline. And this is the same development that we are going to see. It's absolutely true right now. Preventive medicine, for example, I'm doing a blood draw right now every week or so, and the blood draw is quite expensive. Um, this is, of course, not for everybody. But once uh, the, the technology becomes more wide, uh, the use is more widespread, the price will inevitably go down. Imagine your iPhone has more processing power now than a data center that only that was so big that only a country could afford it. Yeah, 20 or 30 years ago. So that that is about what we're talking. Same thing will happen there. Mm -hmm. And in uh, in the future, when this technology is more available, 
how how do you see like the individuals um visits to the doctor like are we going to end up like seeing our doctor once a month to make sure we have some variables aligned or is it um every six months or will there be such routines yes i think there will be routines i mean uh look at like what what we do with every other technical thing and i i i really see um at least part of a body is a technical thing of course we have our, our, our consciousness our soul or whatever but uh, the cells, uh, biologic, basically, it's 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 physics, and uh, with all the other devices that we have, like cars, you bring them to maintenance every ten thousand kilometers, every twenty. Uh, every airplane has maintenance regularly, and, and, and I mean, I, I if you turn it on the head, if you if we would treat airplanes like we treat our bodies, they would all fall out of the sky and not <laughs> to fly with them. Um, so yes, I think we would go for regular checkups. So there will be blood draws. I mean, if you really go into the, the, the territory of science fiction, you could even think about implantable nanosensors that uh, monitor your vitals, uh, also blood monitoring uh, uh, on, on a daily basis, for example. Yeah? You could go and think about yeah, a toilet that's, that does urine and stool analysis every time you pee and, uh, wow. <laughs> and, and monitors your health on a daily basis to catch some unfortunate development um, uh, because this doesn't mean that you won't get sick. It only means that you can catch this as early as possible. Yeah. Um, but that's a, 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 bi a big thing. If you catch something, even cancer, if you catch it super early, you can do something about it. If you, if you catch it only late stage, uh, then mm -hmm. too late, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I look forward to having that toilet. It's such an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> Um, and how do you see the mind-body connection? Because we are not just this biological vehicle roaming on the planet, but we have the spiritual aspect and the mental aspect. What can we do in order to have those parts healthy as we live longer and longer? That, that's a really important aspect. And if you look at our website, also we, pro, we have something that we call uh, the, the health and longevity strategy. And that rests on five pillars, which is personal prevention or whatever you can do by yourself. It's uh, throughout monitoring. It's, it's functional and integrative treatments, like if something is out of balance. It's rejuvenation. But the fifth pillar is mental well-being. And uh, that's hugely important. And I think in order to be really, really healthy, um, you have to have uh, two things in mental well-being. One is a, a, a balanced, uh, you have to be a balanced individual in terms of like purpose, gratitude, all these things are hugely important in, in order to really be healthy because our mind influences our body, um, uh, our thoughts influence our body because our thoughts control, for example, our hormones. You know, uh, if, mm -hmm. we, if we have happy thoughts, then uh, we excrete other hormones and, and uh, that control our body as, as if we are depressed, for example. And vice versa, no? Hormones control thoughts. So. Both ways, even the food that we eat, um, uh, the stuff that we, we digest, our, um, our gut has its own nervous system. That, and, and the gut, for example, produces 13 hormones that <laughs> influence the brain that produces hormones. So there are feedback loops everywhere between mental, uh, nutrition, uh, exercise it's 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 really important and um yeah it's mental well-being and it's also um uh, ridding ourselves of trauma childhood trauma uh, a traumatic experience that we might not even be aware of that con subconsciously control uh, our behavior or our view of the world um that's really important I guess there are two aspects there, no, like ridding ourselves from trauma and building up uh, positive uh, habits that will support and stabilize our minds more, like absolutely, absolutely. yoga, meditation. I don't know if you do any research around those. Uh, well, I did my personal research. I have my yoga routine. I have my meditation routine. Uh, I write a gratitude journal every day. I do affirmations every day. I do visualizations. So um, I do a lot uh, for positive mindset. And um, on top of that, there is self-development. Because um, I think with the world that we are, and, and you mentioned that in the beginning with the radical change and, and uh, in order to cope with the changes that are, are already here and the even the more the ones that are coming, I, ha I think we have all have to do self-development in terms of uh, how do we want to evolve as um, uh, human beings. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of philosophy involved in that as well. 
And um, I think it's necessary in order to um, be able to cope with the change that's coming. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes this very unique Forever Healthy is that you cover the scientific side as well as the spiritual side, as well as the personal development side. You know, you're looking at the whole picture, which I feel we don't get much when we visit a doctor's office. We are more like a biological beings uh, and treated like a chemical uh kind of a mixture or elixir if we have mental issues but what you are doing is like looking at the whole package and trying to maintain and improve the whole package yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, i think it's necessary and i would in, i would love to have a service provider i don't even call him doctor uh, 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 uh like a, a personal health and longevity advisor more trusted friend who also knows a lot about medicine and who can advise me uh, about all these things. Uh, that's one thing that I would love to have. And the other thing is I would love to live in an environment where doing all these things are totally natural. So where, it's good, where I have good food, where everybody meditates, where everybody does yoga, uh, where everybody tries to get rid of trauma and does a gratitude journal and does these regular checkups. So that would make it much easier. This is one reason why it's so hard to do it right now, because only very few people do that. In the holistic way and yeah. um but if i think if more people would do this and uh, or maybe you have some something like a longevity center that even offers yoga and meditation classes and uh talks about philosophy and uh and how to do how to do self actual self-development um that would be a cool place yeah and uh, for those who are listening to us right now and don't have uh, access to such doctors what would you recommend? Is there a list or are you putting together a list of doctors who collaborate and uh, think like this? No, actually, there's no real list. Like, yeah, I mean, this is, um, that's, there, there are some doctors in Germany, there's some in the UK. Uh, it, it really spread out. So this is really, really new. Um, most of the doctors, um, uh, in terms of a new treatment approach, um, what they do is um, uh, functional medicine. That's uh, to look for doctors that do functional medicine. That is already a different approach. This is still about making sick people healthy again. So it's not about this keeping healthy people healthy, but it's uh, viewing uh, the, the person as a holistic uh, uh, thing uh, also with uh, mental. And they would also recommend yoga and meditation and gratitude and nutrition and um, so going to somebody who practices functional medicine is, I think, a good start. Mm -hmm. And talking about nutrition, you published a paper recommending paleo diet. Uh, what do you say to research that contradicts this, that consumption of increased red meat causes further complications like cancer, etc.? Okay, so so uh, we are also we also moved away from calling this a paleo, paleo diet. So um, I would call it uh, evolutionary um, uh, uh, nutrition, so um, feeding the body what, what the body um, uh, used to. So that could also be vegetarian. So this is not about you have to eat red meat. Um, uh, but I think the, the, the connection between red meat and, and uh, increased um, uh, events, for example, cardiovascular disease or uh, cancer, make the distinction between processed red meat, yeah, processed meat, which is not good, which has a lot of stuff in it that, that is not healthy. And, uh, but if you eat a steak that's from an organic um, cow, for example, uh, I think you're not going to hurt yourself. Whereas if you have a hot dog that has a, a, a wiener in it that has I don't know what in it, and you do this every mm -hmm. day uh, and, and, and have white uh, bread buns with it, um, then you're, not, uh, you're hurting yourself. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and is this a new diet type you're talking about? This evolutionary diet, or well, it's it's it, it's an uh, the, the, the there was the paleo community and the functional medicine community, and especially in the U.S. And it just has evolved. There was like five, ten years ago, it was paleo, and then the understanding just broadened. And the basic idea is we should feed our body what the body was designed for by evolution, because I mean, our uh, we are a process of like let's say two million years of evolution. And um, there's new stuff like sugar or refined grains uh, that were introduced into our diet only uh, a thousand years ago or maybe a hundred years ago, like milk or cow's milk or stuff. 
and uh, our body is simply not able to process it well and uh, uh, it would be like putting bad gasoline or uh, into a, a, a car or putting diesel gasoline into a regular car um, it might work but it ha might have unintended side effects and this is where uh, we stand right now so if you eat natural food unprocessed food mm -hmm. veggies um, I think then you're doing the right thing you don't have to be religious about that but um, uh, and, and then better use olive oil than any hydrogenated uh, uh, or artificially processed uh, oils um, uh, then you're doing the good thing and you don't have to be obsessed about diet I think that's also learning from the whole thing i don't obsess about diet anymore i mean i go out and eat ice cream on the weekend with my friends even if there's sugar in there because uh one scoop of ice cream with sugar and milk won't kill me uh, but i don't do it on a daily basis mm -hmm. yeah absolutely although sugar i find personally is very addictive i have a sweet tooth yeah. and yeah. <laughs> and that that was one of the things that i struggled the most to drop and uh, switch to healthier versions at absolutely, least absolutely absolutely um where do you think the government's responsibility are around these uh, ingredients like sugar which is really physically addictive i find or other compounds I, I think the, 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 the whole, we, we shouldn't put too much weight on, 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 on government. I think government, uh, we can be really, we can, uh, I think we should consider ourselves uh, uh, glad and, 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 and happy if we have a government that provides an environment where everybody can do uh, 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 freely what, what he seems necessary for his personal health and, and happiness. And um, I think we should all use our own brain. I mean, the information that sugar is not good for your health or that uh, white bread and uh, refined grains are not good for your health. It's openly available. And um, uh, we should not wait for the government to forbid or do stuff. We should just, everybody could just decide, stop doing this. And then the economy <laughs> simply, uh, if people don't buy the products anymore, um, uh, they will not be sold. But it's also kind of very um, confusing and time consuming to really read, research, understand what is bad and what includes what. Like when I go to the supermarket, I sometimes see even green beans have sugar in them, canned green beans. Yeah. And I feel like cheated in a way. It's just well, it's supposed to be some vegetables. Sim so. Simple rule, don't buy any canned food because yeah, you don't know what right. to put in there for, for conserving conserve it, conserve it or, or whatever, you know, you don't know. Stop. Yeah, exactly. But to arrive there, I had to read a lot of labels and go to different supermarkets and test different food and see if that's right. It tastes okay with it, without it, etc. So it's on our website. It's my own learning. I did this. <laughs> I did all the, what you describe, I did the same process and I just wrote the results down a few pages, really simple, not even religion. That's not religion about diet. It's just really a basic, uh, si simple straight thoughts so don't buy uh, manufactured processed food don't buy eat, don't eat canned food eat only I, I only eat stuff where I know what's what's in it I don't even eat complex sauces or so something like this mm -hmm. I want yeah. olive oil uh, I want my steak in coconut oil or olive oil this is what I understand I have that on my salad and vinegar and and, and salt and pepper and some lemon uh, this is good for me I know that and uh, that's my real simple rule. I, I don't eat stuff that I don't know what's in it. So, and it uh, should be organic, of course, if, 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 if possible, but uh, often that's not possible. So where do you think this education should come from? This is coming from your own personal experience, but not everyone has the kind of mental span and the time span to do this. Where else can we receive this education Oh, I think it's it's uh, more and more people are doing it. I mean, you see, uh, we have more and more organic supermarkets around. If you look back 20 years ago, there were virtually none. Now you have them uh, everywhere. I mean, it, this, the, the, this is quite easy to buy organic food now. And I think that the, it's a process. I mean, parents will learn about this and teach their children about that. Um, uh, and um, you have to make the basic decision that health is important. And... Yeah. Um, uh, then you have to spend some time right now on it. So I think it's not an excuse to say, oh, I didn't have the time to learn about health. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is why I'm sick and the government should have protected me. Um, this is not the reality. Reality is that yeah. the government does not protect you, but you've got a brain uh, and you could use that brain and, and um, 
and uh, follow some simple rules about good nutrition. And um, yep. Yeah. And uh, just briefly going back to Forever Healthy, you also manage startups. If you have 14 promising startups that the, your team uh, is involved and in managing, can you tell us about this aspect of Forever Healthy? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, well, we started four years ago because the, 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 the industry, there's no industry yet. It's, it was really, really uh, new. So um, uh, when I started like five years ago with the donation to the Sense Foundation to support research, um, I, 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 I also felt in really in order to accelerate the, the, the whole process of bringing rejuvenation biotechnology and this new form of medicine to the market, um, uh, the, the, this is, it's, not, it's not enough just to have basic research and to talk about the beautiful future um, because it always sounds like science fiction if you just talk about that. People say, oh, wow, yeah, the, but this is science fiction. It's not real. And mm -hmm. uh, in order to really prove that it's working, I think we have to deliver results. We have to deliver therapies. And once the first therapies are there um, that really prove that, that it's not science fiction, that it's easy, that it's affordable, and uh, for the finance community, that's the best business ever. But because you see even $10 a month, but if you have 4 billion clients, um, uh, uh, that's a lot of money every month. And um, in order to, to really get people to understand what's coming, we just have to deliver products. And, um, and this is what we started four years ago to pick a really promising science and, and help to uh, get teams together. So in order that they start building therapies for human use uh, and uh, I mean, once we have a therapy that, for example, rejuve rejuvenates the uh, cardiovascular system in such a way that we can prevent heart attacks and strokes, people will understand. Uh, and, and, and then it will be normal to do that. And what kind of products are we talking about? Um, basically, it's, it's, we're going for the root causes of age-related diseases. So that we, we uh, scientists did the question, so what is really the root cause? And... Um, all of our startups are working on a different root cause that causes age-related diseases, like, for example, senescent cells. Um, senescent cells are cells um, th that are supposed to be removed. So, you know, every cell has a life cycle and mm -hmm. it's a really cool system. And if a cell comes to the end of its life cycle, it should either commit suicide or it calls in the immune system to remove it. And um, this works, but not perfectly. So some um, cells stay around. And uh, this uh, suicide or immune system removal doesn't work. And uh, they go into a sort of an emergency um, um, metabolism and produce a lot of toxins. And this is just a statistical thing. And if you're young, of course, only few cells, but you accumulate the cells as you age. And over time, there are more and more of those producing more and more of toxins and, uh, and uh, accelerating aging. So we have a startup that works on, or we have even two startups that work on um, uh, therapies on how to remove these toxic cells from the body. That's one thing. And so there are other root causes like the calcification uh, that I mentioned with EDTA. We have a startup that do, does a very targeted therapy that allows us to remove EDTA from calcified arteries. We have the one that does the heart attack thing. We have a, a startup that um, uh, uh, develops an, a, a very interesting anti-cancer therapy. Uh, because there are people who are immune to cancer, people who don't get cancer. And what we do is we see how these people, uh, we um, uh, extract their immune system by, by a blood draw. And then we, we are working on multiplying this immune system, the immune cells in a bioreactor. And if, a peop if somebody comes with a cancer diagnosis, we can inject this immune system into people with cancer and uh, remove the cancer that way. So that's the idea. And it already works in the mouse model. So we can inject uh, um, uh, pancreatic cancer into a mouse and the mouse grows a thumb-sized cancer. And if we inject our, um, uh, our uh, multiplied immune system uh, uh, 48 hours later, uh, the, the, the tumor is gone. Wow. Wow. That's very promising and exciting. Yeah. 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 So we still have to transport that to humans, but in animals it works. Yeah. And how do you know if someone is immune to cancer or not? Uh, family history, uh, trying mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, basically it's family history. And then you do, you do a lot of uh, blood draws on, on multiple people and then, then you start testing and then you find that donor. 
or, or mm -hmm. that doesn't. So yeah, it's a it's a, a challenging task, but we have we have some that 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 uh, work. Yeah, and are you continuously accepting applications from biotech startups? Yes. Yeah, we, we are really into that process, um, uh, but we are not just. Uh, it's not just any biotech, but we mm -hmm. what we are looking for is what we call category openers. So I said we already have two. Uh, Startups working on this removal of senescent cells, and um, the, the the point is, we don't, we wouldn't do a third thing, or we wouldn't do something that somebody's already doing. Um, we are we are really looking for something that has never been done before, and that we think should be done. Um, but yeah, we are we are um, uh, constantly looking at new proposals of startups in that area. And uh, anyone who's interested in applying could do that via your website, right? Yes, absolutely. Just write us an email, um, uh, hello at foreverhealthy.org or ventures at dizu.com. You find that on our websites. And uh, just send us the proposal, uh, what you're working on. We're going to look at it. And Michael, um, I really hope as a friend also that you will have more than 120 years to live. But um, let's settle with 120 for now. Um, where do you see this technology uh, in several decades? Like how fast can we expect results? Actually, we don't know. That, that's really true. We don't know. Uh, I know for our startups that will, it will take uh, something between five and ten years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we have the first product, it's really a long-term thing developing a therapy in medicine. Um, between and first product doesn't mean it's available to public, right? Yes, first product available to public uh, in five to ten years, oh. and that's already pretty exciting. And uh, actually, we don't know. And and this is also, I think, it's going to be an inflection point when we have these first products. Then uh, the world will understand what, what's what's really possible, and people would ask, what else can we do? And then uh, we think more money will flow in. We already see now more money flowing into the market. But then when the first therapy is there and working, this is really when more money, really excessive amount of money will flow in. It's going to be attractive for more researchers to work into that market. And I'm hoping for an exponential development, both in research as also in, in company funding then. And do you think for anyone who is in their 40s, 50s uh, today, they will benefit from this technology to reach 120 or is there like a threshold that you have to be younger no i think 40 to 50 uh, then you're still young enough uh, to benefit of, of that stuff because uh, then you're in your in then 10 years you're in the 60s and then you might have a therapy that prevents you from having a heart attack or um, dying of cancer and mm -hmm. that's already huge i mean i don't know whether you will make it to 120 with that uh, but you probably won't have a heart attack on that way uh, which is also something because lots of people die like in the age of 50 or 60 with a heart attack. And uh, you can, you will know, oh, I'm not one of them. I don't have to worry about cancer. I don't have to worry about heart attacks, for example. Which generation would be the first to reach 120 without any diseases caused by aging? Well, maybe we are the generation who does that. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But, Hopefully. Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> yeah. I, I, always, I, I also, for myself, I reverse that question, you know. Uh, there's going to be one generation that will have the, the first real benefit of this uh, this therapy. And um, uh, uh, if you and, and you could just imagine uh, these uh, uh, members of that generation sitting there and thinking, could it really be us? Could it really? Yeah. Be us? Yeah. yeah and, absolutely. Uh, uh, so it could be us. You know, we don't know. Uh, one thing I know for sure, if we don't try, it's not yeah. going to be us. So yeah. um, I'm trying two things. I'm trying to accelerate the development of these therapies. And on the other hand, I try to do everything that's possibly, uh, reasonably possibly right now to stay healthy because of course it's better than when I'm still healthy to have these therapies as if I'm sick. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for trying, Michael. Hopefully we will all benefit from your trials. And thank yeah. you so much for also keeping such an optimistic view of human health and, and the future, uh, that's really uplifting to hear all the good case scenarios that we won't always screw things up. Yes. That there is still hope and that we will make good use of such technologies. And thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, there is more to talk. So I hope one day we will do another episode with you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ella. Thank you.